Mrs. Rector, honored academicians, professors, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here, of course. Uh, thank you very much to all for those kind words. I, I hardly recognized myself. Uh, but uh, I, I feel very privileged to have been professionally alive and active for the last 40 years. Because as we all know, this, this past 40 years have meant a tremendous advancement in, in technology and especially in, uh, in information sciences. I'm going to concentrate on, on a rather narrow field, which is my own, own research field, that of uh, uh, machine learning and pattern recognition. Uh, 40 years is, is really a long time, and when I, when I started to pre pre prepare my talk, I had to remember where was I actually exactly 40 years ago, which means the year 1973. Well, I can tell you, I was in the Finnish army <laughs> with some friends. <clears throat> right. And the PhD we did with Olavi and, and many others, and so uh, in a way the, the story began. I'll divide my talk into four chapters, neural networks, pattern recognition, machine learning, big data, mostly kind of filtered through my own, own experiences in these fields. Let me start with, with neural networks. Uh, when I studied uh, technical mathematics at HUT in late 60s and early 70s, it was possible to choose the, the minor subject rather freely, and I chose physiology because I was very interested actually in the question of how the human brain works. And actually my first paper, scientific paper, even my affiliation is Institute of Physiology, University of Helsinki, I'm quite proud of that. It, it dealt with some, some mathematical models of a functioning of what now would be called a spiking neuron. Uh, so this is a kind of schematic picture of, of a neural network this is, this is a kind of mathematical picture of a neural network. We often, in this field, we imagine that uh, we have this kind of parallel layers of, of, of neurons, or layers of parallel neurons, and then these layers are feeding signals into the next layer with the inputs here and, and the output here. And an individual neuron, let me get a bit technical because otherwise this talk is not so nice. So an individual neuron works like this, you have inputs, and can be hundreds, thousands of inputs, then uh, each input enters the neuron through some weights. This is also real for, for uh, biological neurons. They have the so-called synaptic connections through which these presynaptic fibers are attached to the postsynaptic uh, membrane. And then, then this Y here is just the weighted sum of the inputs weighted by these, these weights. And now learning in neural networks simply means that these weights are changing their values. That's learning. Perhaps, perhaps even in the human brain, the, the strongest uh, uh, phenomenon of learning simply means that these synaptic connections between the neurons are changing. And the learning rule, of course, looks something like this. In order for this synapse to change, we need uh, the input, the, the weight itself, and then, then the, the postsynaptic uh, potential for this learning rule. And uh, in my PhD thesis, in my PhD studies, I was lucky, actually, to be invited by Tevo, if I remember correctly, Professor Kohonen, to his group. And then uh, the topic was very much associative memories. It's a kind of parallel, distributed kind of uh, memory storage that, that Tevo had, had discovered and worked on, on for some time before I, before I came. This was a very nice paper in biological cybernetics in the middle of my, my, my PhD studies. Uh, but during, during that time, I started to wonder, what is this mysterious function f that I just showed you? Could it be simplified, modified, whatever? So uh, there was a very influential conjecture made by, by a scientist called Donald Hebb in 1949, a long time ago, that this synaptic strength, strength between two neurons in, in the real biological neural network like you have in your, in your head strengthens when both the presynaptic input is strong and also this postsynaptic neuron is firing strongly. So you need these two effects. And of course the simplest way, at least for a mathematician, is to have some kind of AND 
both y and x are strong, then, then we have uh, something, something positive going on. The problem with this learning rule is that it leads to eternal growth. They just keep on growing and growing. Um, and uh, I was equally lucky in my postdoctoral studies where I joined the group of uh, Leon Cooper at Brown University. He's a, he's a Nobel laureate in physics, but very interested also in, uh, in uh, computational uh, neuroscience. And uh, we, we, we had this kind of theory, I, I don't explain it here, that, that explains how these neurons kind of learn to be specific, but then they can also lose the specificity by a certain adaptive threshold. Uh, I didn't really like that model very much, even if I'm, I had to do it, but, but uh, I, I was interested in something that I felt would be simpler. Why don't we have some kind of forgetting in this, in this, uh, in this learning equation? So that if this, this becomes very large, then there is a kind of a complementary term that tends to taper down this uh, synaptic weight learning. So that uh, if this W is very large, very strong, then, then this term, of course, is large. And also, there, there should be something related to the, to the output of the neuron. Um, and, uh, well, it, it was really my, my invention to, to just plug in here the most uh, simple, the simplest uh, positive function that you can imagine, which is a square. And then when you do a little bit of statistics and mathematics very simple mathematics, actually, then, then you notice that, ha, ah, this is doing principal component analysis. And I published this when I was already uh, an associate professor of mathematics at Kuopio University. Uh, in those days, uh, the Ministry of Education very strictly uh, controlled all the professors' chairs. And that was the time when the university system in Finland was, was getting larger. And so there were no chairs in Helsinki, all the chairs were in Kuopio, Joensu, Oulu, wherever. And, and me and all my friends went, went out. I went to Kuopio. Anyway, this has become a rather influential model, actually. And uh, I was quite interested to see, see when I've been following slightly this human brain project now, that uh, they have this model of spiking neurons, how they, they are learning. And for instance, Wolfram Gerstner from EPFL in Lausanne, has a very nice model of a spiking neuron, kind of this rule that I just described, where, where the, the other assumption is that this presynaptic spike comes first, and then only after that the postsynaptic spike, and then the learning could go on, more or less according to that equation. Okay, but uh, I was trained as an engineer, diploma engineer, doctor of science and technology, so um, at this time I somehow started to lose, lose my interest in, in, in physiology, and actually I never went back. Uh, I wanted to do something, something useful also in, in the new, new universities where I was. This was not so hot, so, uh, so they wanted me to do some projects. Okay, so I come to pattern recognition. Uh, I'm sure many of you know what pattern recognition means, but basically it means classifying objects based on their measurements. For instance, handwritten characters is a typical problem. Speech recognition or human face recognition, uh, gener generic video footage recognizing what, what goes on in, in the movies, and so on. It's a core technology in robotics, document processing, smart cities, and, and so on and so on. Uh, very much growing technology today, very important technology in, uh, in uh, all this ub ubiquitous computing and so on. Uh, as a generic technology, it started around the same time when I, when I started my professional Career. It's quite interesting. So I've seen this development over the years. And actually my first lecture course that I've developed at uh, Helsinki University of Technology was the course Principles of Pattern Recognition, which I started in 1975. And a couple of weeks, next January, I start to lecturing again. It, I don't know how, how many times I've done it. I've changed the slides a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the core, core things in this kind of this kind of a subject, they, they kind of stay the same for a surprisingly long times. So of course, there are many new, new developments. And then with Tewa, we established uh, the Finnish Pattern Recognition Society in 1977, which was the year when I got my, my doctorate. And uh, I, I managed to, this, this uh, principal component idea, I managed to develop it into a kind of learning subspace method. Again, we worked on that with Tewa. 
and uh, published a book that surprisingly was translated into Japanese and, and also Chinese. This shows the decision surfaces of the subspace classifier on a, on a unit sphere. But uh, let me give some examples, more practical examples of pattern recognition that I did with, with my, my students mostly. Uh, after Kuopio, I moved to, to Lappeenrand, the University of Technology. I got a full professor's chair in computer science. And uh, there I had a very talented graduate student called Jouko Lampinen, who got his PhD in 1992. And we were working on um, face, face recognition in, in these experiments. And now uh, the tool that we mostly used was Kohonen's self-organizing map, which is an extremely useful, useful and, and practical method for, for doing clustering and actually even, even uh, supervised uh, uh, pattern recognition. You have a face and then you took some visual features, in this case Kabor, Kabor features, and then these uh, long, high dimensional vectors that are somehow describing what goes on in a small patch in, in a face image that you feed into, in this case, a two-layered SOM structure and, and then try to find out which neuron is, is active and then that signifies, gives a kind of label to this small spot. Then, then you can look at the histogram of these labels and classify the faces. Another uh, Continuation slightly of the same idea I did with, with Jorma Laaksonen, who was a very talented graduate student whom I met when I came to Helsinki University of Technology just 20 years ago, 1993. And uh, Jorma got his uh, PhD in 1997, and then we started to devel develop this. Why don't we just take a huge collection of images and map them with the self-organizing map into a kind of ordered service? And then we could use that for, for browsing and for searching these images. For instance, here we have just a rather small collection of, of faces and they have been mapped on this, on this self-organizing map. You may notice that more or less similar, uh, similar faces are always in, in a certain region of the map. That is the, the property of the, of the self-organizing map. Finally, I had again a talented graduate student called Matti Axela a bit later. And this, is, this was an industrial project uh, started uh, in the uh, early 2000s. Nokia Corporation had a vision that uh, the, these uh, telephones would have a screen on which you could somehow write with hand. And they wanted to do so-called online character recognition. So you write by hand and then you can write, for instance, a telephone number or perhaps even a text message. And so, so we were working on, on text. Uh, this is, a, this is what a person, person would write. Sometimes it fails, then he has to write again and once again, and then finally there's a recognition. Sometimes it's easier, and so the hello world is recognized by the, by the portable phone or, or a handheld small device. There were no iPads, no smartphones in, in those days, of course. So, uh, machine learning. Um, that was kind of... A, practical projects, sometimes industrial projects, but I never really lost my first love, which was this, this weird equation that I showed to you earlier. You remember Y was the output of the neuron, Xi was the input to, to a certain weight, weight Wi, and then we had this forgetting term, and then Y was just a linear combination of the inputs. That's, that's, the, that's the starting point. And this produced the principal component analysis neuron. I, I wondered for a long time what would happen if we, if we replace this, this uh, linear term with a nonlinear term. We would get some kind of nonlinear principal components, but what does it mean? Those of you who know principal components know that it's not, not very sensible to talk about nonlinear principal components. But uh, we, did, we did that and then tried, and uh, something very interesting comes out, which is uh, so-called independent component analysis, much stronger technique than, than principal component analysis. Uh, all we have to do is to change this linear y xi into h of y xi, where h is a nonlinear function, and then this function here has to be the derivative of that function. Of course, I have no time to explain why, but we have a very solid mathematical theory for this. And the function could be, for instance, uh, the third power. Not first, not second, they are not good. The third, fourth, fifth. Likely the thir third is a very good one. And then, then, of course, how this, how this learning really goes on is that we must have a sample of these x, x i's. 
we have a sample of x size, then we can compute y, and then we can make like one step of this learning, then we, then we take another sample x i, compute y, and then, then go on. And the, the, the best way to do it in, is in a kind of batch mode in which you simply collect a sample and, and uh, compute the average of the right-hand side, and then we update. We also need some, some pre-processing, but I don't want to go into that. Let's, let's, let's look at an example. Um, let's imagine that we have nine images, and I know because, because we made them ourselves, that these uh, are simply linear mixtures of nine unknown images. So you, you can imagine that you have nine pictures, let's say on, on a transparent slide, and then you just put them on top of each other. And then they lose all their details and you get uh, mixtures like this. But now we don't show to the algorithm of course, the original images. This is the only information that the algorithm has. The only information. And now this x1 to x9 would be uh, pixels in a certain location in these images. For instance, if, if x1 is this pixel at the right, at, at the left upper corner, then x2 would be x3. They would be the pixels in the same corner. And then the sample we get by changing the location so that this, 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 this would be one one nine-dimensional sample, one of the many. We have as, as many samples as we have pixels in those images. Okay, you, you get it, you get it. Then we just apply this algorithm on, on these. And finally, when it has converged, uh, we compute to this uh, uh, linear sum, and then we construct an image in which these have been placed as, as pixels. And what do we get? This. And from, from all of these nine images, just uh, by repeating this same, same thing nine times, starting from different initial, initial conditions, we get this kind of nine images, which are the hidden factors. And this algorithm does not really need any other information, but, but simply this, and the assumption that these mixtures are linear mixtures of something unknown, hidden. Um, this, uh, this is the kind of famous ICA algorithm, fast ICA algorithm. We established an ICA group in the lab. Uh, myself, uh, Juha Karhunen, is Juha here? Giving a lecture, right? Okay. <laughs> Juha, Professor Juha Karhunen, and the, then we had two very talented grad students, Apo Hyvärinen and, and Ricardo Vigario. Uh, actually, Apo is now in Kyoto visiting for a longer time, so he sent me his congratulations, but he could not be here. And with Ricardo, we actually were the first to suggest the use of ICA on, on images. That's, of course, a totally artificial example, but there are some, some real examples in which you really have some two-dimensional data or images, and you can use this. There, there was, at that time, there was one group in San Diego, one in Tokyo, that uh, were using ICA for kind of one-dimensional signals, audio signal separation, but we were definitely the first to suggest this on, on images. And our fast ICA algorithm became quite popular, maybe the most popular ICA algorithm there, there is. Uh, it also offered very nice mathematical statistical problems. I, I mean, I hope that all of you young scientists will sometimes be in a, in, a, in a situation in which you have discovered something interesting, intriguing, and probably very useful, and still it's so easy that you can solve it. I mean, but, but still challenging enough so that the others cannot solve it, some, or how to put it. So you have to be just on the threshold of things, things. and th that was exactly the time, late, late 90s, early, early 2000s, that was a wonderful time. So we wrote this book, Independent Component Analysis, that very quickly was also translated into Japanese and Chinese. Uh, a major application of ICA is, is neuroinformatics, for instance, the analysis of magnetic resonance imaging data, and I believe that Ricardo certainly will, will, will talk about talk about this. Uh, there are other applications. One, one I already mentioned would be the so-called cocktail party effect in which if you all started to talk at the same time, then this microphone would just get a mixture of your voices. And then if, then if there's another microphone, it would get another mixture of your voices. And from these two mixtures, we could try to separate your individual voices. That can be done to a rather good extent. Another one is this... Uh, uh, wireless communications in which signals arrive at the, at the antenna of a portable phone and you have to somehow separate which signals are the ones that are meant to that phone and which ones are the, those that are meant to the neighbor whose discussion you don't want to, want to listen. Uh, so ICA is an example of machine learning. 
this strange term machine learning, what does it mean? I, I, I like to present it in this way. We have certain fields of science, computer science, probabilistic modeling, meaning probability theory, and then we have the problem of analysis of natural data, especially natural data in which I, I don't mean any bit stream, streams or, or perhaps, perhaps not, not even text, but things like images, videos, industrial measurements, real, real floating point data. So then machine learning would be somewhere, somewhere here when you apply probabilistic modeling to certain computer science type problems, then, then you have machine learning. Statistics, of course, is in the, in the intersection of probabilistic modeling and, and the, the data analysis. And finally, the data mining is, is perhaps some, some, somewhere there. Data mining can be kind of discrete mathematical problem without any, without any probabilities in some cases. So it's a collection of algorithmic techniques for analyzing and modeling data. And the, the important thing about machine learning is that it is data-driven. You cannot solve the problem unless you have data. So you must have so-called training data set, which, which should be very large. And then when you have this training data set, then you can try to build a simplified model of the training data, and then you can use the model for prediction and understanding. Like in, in this example, small example that I showed, this large data would be these images. They have a, a large number of pixels. And then, then I'm building a model saying that there are some hidden factors there. And then I solve the model, and then certainly I understand much better what these nine images are because now I had the clean images compared to the, to the, to the other ones. Okay, uh, somehow still the, the pillars of research in our lab is SOM and ICA that, that have been developed in our own laboratory, but now, now there are many, many extensions that some of the people in this, in this room are, are working, especially these so-called latent variable models, Bayesian techniques. And, uh, I guess we have been rather successful. I don't know if you believe in any university rankings, but there is, is something called Microsoft Academic Search, and uh, you, can, you can rank universities not only by fields, but also by subfields. So in this case, uh, computer science, and in computer science, machine learning and pattern recognition. And then when you look at the number of citations of the various universities in the world, then you notice that all the universities number one outside United States. Uh, and the tenth in the world. There are only some universities like uh, MIT, Berkeley, Stanford, San Diego, Carnegie Mellon, Princeton, and then a couple of companies like Microsoft, IBM, and Google that are better than us in the number of citations in this field. Of course, all years, all, con all years meaning that over this. Also, there was, there was time. It's, of course, included here. So then I, then I finally come to this uh, big, big data. I, I, I told you that machine learning always needs this training data set. And so um, actually, actually machine learning wants to have a big training data set. It's eager to get it. So it's a natural technique for analyzing data that is big. Um, this is, everybody knows this, uh, uh, that it has been measured that every day about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created, which is, which is a lot of data. So it's, it's an exponential, exponential growth, doubles about every, every 40 months. And uh, whenever you think of any, anything that is exponential, then at, then, and then at least I get scared. I mean, there will be a time when, when something happens with, with this kind of exponential things. And what has now happened is that uh, we really need to do something about this data. We just cannot keep on storing it on disks forever and ever. Uh, main, sources, main sources for the big data, you still hear me? Yeah, main sources for the big data, uh, by far the largest is really big science, so automatic measurement systems like in particle physics, astronomy, atmospheric science, genomics, brain research. But then also human-made, human-made data like in um, social networks, in the next text documents phone call records and so on, military surveillance, of course. You know that some of this big data is used for rather obnoxious uh, purposes, but uh, not, not all. It, it's, it's, it's here to stay. Uh, well, just, just to give you some numbers, for instance, in Facebook, um, every day 300 million photos, 4 million videos are posted 
Twitter has 400 million tweets per day. Google, 2 million queries every minute. Flickr, 4.5 million photos every day. YouTube, 1 trillion videos stored. So these are huge numbers. And no, no single human being can certainly kind of browse them all. That's totally impossible. So we need automated techniques to do, to do something about that. Uh, Machine-generated big data is, is even worse. CERN, this large Hadron <coughs> Collider, produces one petabyte a second of data. Of course, mostly thrown away, but still it's, it's, a, it's a large number. And when we look at technologies for big data, I just took this from the McKinsey report. I have <coughs> written this myself. If you look at this list classification, cluster analysis, blah, 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 then you see that this is exactly the research agenda of our lab for uh, at least the last 20 or 30 years. So somehow we have been lucky. Uh, there, have, there have been thousands of scientific articles written on this, of course. And if I come to the Center of Excellence on Computational Inference, that tool already described in a very nice way, so nice that I, I cannot do it any better. Uh, then we really follow this 40-year-old tradition of doing research, especially on machine learning and pattern recognition. Uh, in this center, we, we have some uh, core kind of theoretical techniques, learning models from massive data, learning from multiple data sources, learning from structured data, and then extreme inference engine doing it really fast. And you see some familiar names here. There's Il Ilkka Niemelä, myself, Sami Kaski, Erika Aurel from, from KTH, Jorma Laaksonen, and then we have two people from Helsinki University, Petri Myllymäki from Computer Science, and Jukka Korander from Mathematics and Statistics. And we try to solve the problem of what is future computational inference. We are now entering the third year, so let's see how it, how it goes. Uh, finally, just one, one example of this kind of big data processing. Um, one, one source of this kind of real-world data that is kind of difficult is uh, videos. Uh, I, don't, I don't really know how much of, of videos there are on the web, but it's, it's a huge amount. And lots of these videos does not have any annotation, any caption, or any, any text. Of course, the video itself sometimes has some text in the pictures, but basically it's just the audio and, the, and, the, and then, the, then the video. And now if you, if you think of the question, how do you index this kind of databases? What are the keywords that you use for searching in this kind of video databases? Then there are no keywords. A human can immediately tell what, here, what happens here, but it's impossible to have humans going over millions of hours of video and annotating. It's impossible. So we have to have automatic techniques to annotate videos. And so this is one, one of the research topics that we are doing, doing in, in my in my center of excellence, this so-called intelligent information access. And so what we would like to have is for each video shot, some descriptive words that describe what goes on in the video so that we could, we could search based on those. Like here, this happens indoor, there are reporters, there's a single person, there's an anchor person, and it's a new studio. Already with this, you could do some kind of searching, some kind of indexing. And then the other, other source of information, of course, is what he's saying. And uh, for that, we need a speech, automatic speech recognition, because made by Mikko, Mikko Kurimo, because there is, no, there is no text. So you must understand there's, there's it's a spoken speech, which you have to tra translate into, into written, written text automatically without a human intervention. So um, let's see how it goes. Viitosaarelle rakennetaan monitoimihalli. Uimahallin jatkeeksi rakennettavan monitoimihallin urakat maksavat pari miljoonaa euroa. Viitosaaren tekninen lautakunta valitsi urakoitsijat halvimman tarjouksen perusteella eilen. Valtion rahoitusta monitoimihalliin on saatu noin miljoona euroa. Rakentamisen on määrä alkaa tänä vuonna. So uh, that was not of course real time because the, as you see the speed recognition was done before before she even said anything, but, it, but uh, uh, basically what, what you saw at, at the lower end was, was, the, was the written text about what, what she said, and then up, up there you saw these, these labels, 
labels for the. So I come to the conclusions of my talk. My, my time is up. Um, well, all I can say, it has been fun. Very fun and luckily also, also rewarding. You never know when you, when you start a research career whether it's rewarding, but usually it's, it's fun anyway. And I think one, one message that I would like to say here is that we made the right choice in going for pattern recognition and machine learning, or what, it, what was called neural networks at the time, in the 1970s. Somehow the world has come our way. Of course, we have been following the world, but we were going there and the world has come somehow come our way. Thank you Teo, <laughs> very much for that. Please remember that it was 10 years before the PC was invented. It was 10 years before the internet protocol was defined, 15 years before World Wide Web came out. So we did not know anything about this. We could not even predict whether the computers would keep on evolving. And this big data phenomenon certainly nobody could predict in, in those days because computers in, in, at that time were used for, for com computing. They are computers. <laughs> okay, so let me finish by, by giving many, many thanks to the former students and colleagues who made this possible. Many of you are in this room. Also to the collaborators in the application fields, labs of, of Alto abroad, and also industry who have put our methods to real use because the real use is the final measure of success. And of course, many thanks to, to the, all these organizations who gave us money, HUT, Alto University, Academy of Finland, Tekes, and also some foreign, foreign sources. And finally, many thanks to Aalto University, the rector, vice rector and the deans for, for, the, for this button. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It's nice to wear this. <laughs> so thank you all. <laughs>